We're finally moving on to Unit 3 of AP Biology, which is all about energetics. So let's get to it right away. Hi everyone, my name is Mikey from AVO Prep Academy, and we're finally moving on to Unit 3, which is going to be about energy, cell respiration, and photosynthesis. Now, it is largely divided into those three chapters, chapters 8, 9, and 10 of Campbell Biology, and today's video is going to focus on the first part of chapter 8, which is about energy and how it transforms through biological systems. And then, after we set this up, we'll release a different video on enzymes from chapter 8, and then we'll talk about cell respiration and photosynthesis in subsequent videos. So today is the very first step and it can be a little bit challenging if you haven't taken physics to truly understand what energy is all about. So what I want to do in this video is to first define what energy is and how that pertains to biological systems and then we'll talk about how the transformation of that energy through biochemical reactions can be largely categorized into two separate distinctive categories and then lastly we'll talk about how biological systems will utilize that energy in doing the things that it needs to do in order to survive and reproduce produce. So firstly, let's define what energy is. In physics, we define energy as the capacity to do work, and work is simply force applied across the distance. And in terms of mechanics, this can seem a little bit simpler, because if you want to stop a moving car, or you want to hit a golf ball across the field, then yes, you can clearly see how you're applying that force across the distance, and that required energy to do that. But in biology, it can be a little bit more confusing. So the first thing that we need to do to understand how energy can be pertinent to biological systems is by laying down some ground rules over the universe first. Now, what do I mean by ground rules? Well, let's think about this for a moment. We know that gravitational potential energy goes from high to low. As in, if you drop a ball from up high, it's going to drop to the ground. We also know that air molecules will move from an area of higher pressure to lower pressure. As in, if you blow up a balloon and let it go, then the air molecules are going to come out. And we also know that heat transfers from a warmer body to a cooler body. So these are some ground rules of the universe. But one ground rule that you may not be familiar with is called entropy. So what is entropy? Entropy is a measure of disorder in a system, and we have actually talked about it before. In this diagram, we're reviewing what we call diffusion. And in this scenario, we learned that molecules will move from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. But there's another way to think about this. If you take a look at all the molecules that are clustered together on one side, we can say that this is more organized. And if you look at all the molecules that are separated into equidistant positions, then we can say that it's more random or it has greater disorder. And as you can see, diffusion tells us that materials will move from where there is greater order to where there is less order. And just like that, what we know about the universe is that it likes to increase entropy. And unlike energy, which typically goes from high to low, entropy goes from low to high. Now, this is actually part of a study that we call thermodynamics, which tells us in its second law that entropy has a tendency to increase in our universe. So why does this matter? Well, instead of looking at diffusion of molecules, what we can do is to think about that in a slightly different way. So for instance, let's imagine that instead of molecules, we're we're talking about atoms as part of a bigger molecule. So in this diagram, what we see on the left side is a glucose molecule with carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens all organized in a very orderly manner. And on the right side, what we have are carbon dioxide molecules and water molecules, which are organized to a certain degree, but certainly less organized than what we see with the glucose molecule. So in this scenario, we can also say that glucose is more ordered than carbon dioxide and water. And as such, what the universe would have a tendency to do would be to break down glucose into carbon dioxide and water molecules. And this trend is incredibly important because glucose wanting to become carbon dioxide and water doesn't mean that it's going to happen spontaneously, yet it is the favored reaction of the universe. And when anything is favored, it does not require any energy, and in fact, it can release energy. So the idea here then is that if you want to go against the desires of the universe, going from a more entropic system like carbon dioxide and water back to a more organized, less entropic system like glucose, that will then, by default, require energy to do. In fact, what we see here is essentially photosynthesis and cell respiration modeled 
with the idea of entropy. Photosynthesis is a cell process that combines carbon dioxide and water into glucose molecules, which requires energy from the sun. And cell respiration is the process whereby glucose is broken back down into carbon dioxide and water, releasing energy. So we can see that energy transfers and the way that entropy works is going to be coupled together, which leads us to the second part of this video, which deals with two distinctive types of biochemical reactions that we need to investigate in this unit. So the first type is what we call catabolic reactions, and the second type is called anabolic reactions. And both of these reactions link directly to the ideas of entropy that we just talked about. So first, let's talk about catabolic reactions. Catabolic reactions take complex matter and make it simpler, which means that it's taking more organized substances and creating greater disorder. This means that entropy is increasing. And all of these traits of catabolic reactions means that this is going with the flow of the universe, which means that it should be releasing energy. So when we talk about catabolic reactions, such as cell respiration, where glucose breaks down into carbon dioxide and water, uh, there are several other features of catabolic reactions that we can combine into a single rubric. So let's do it simply. First, catabolic reactions take complex materials and make it simple. This means that entropy increases. And because we're going with the flow of the universe, energy is typically released, making this into what we call an exergonic reaction. Exergonic reactions have generally what we call a negative enthalpy and a negative free energy change. And lastly, because it's favored, it's more likely to be a spontaneous reaction. So we can group all of those ideas into a single rubric. What about anabolic reactions though? Anabolic reactions, what we essentially have are simpler materials becoming complex with the input of energy. Yes! Oh my gosh! So reversing that catabolic reactions into anabolic reactions, we can now talk about traits of anabolic reactions that are opposite to the catabolic reaction. Anabolic reaction, firstly, takes simple things and creates complexity, which means that it is decreasing entropy. And because it's going against the grain of the universe, it's going to require energy, making this into what we call an endergonic reaction, which has a positive enthalpy change and a positive free energy change with respect to the molecules that are being created. And as such, it's less likely to be spontaneous and more likely than not, we call these anabolic reactions non-spontaneous reactions. So as you can see, catabolic and anabolic reactions are opposites of one another, but they are very important opposites because they are paired together in many instances through biological systems. So here, what I'm going to do is talk about the flow of energy through biological systems in a simplified way. So let's start with the sun, because the sun provides majority of the energy that is needed by living systems. So the sun releases energy through its nuclear fusion reaction, and it arrives on our planet as electromagnetic radiation. What happens next is that plants will take carbon dioxide and water molecules, using that energy from the sun, create a complex molecule called glucose. So this is what we would consider to be an anabolic reaction. However, the plants themselves and animals who eat those plants will then take that glucose molecule and break it back down into carbon dioxide and water, thereby performing a catabolic reaction that releases energy. The release energy then is used to create what we call adenosine triphosphate, the currency of energy within the cell from its constituent components, adenosine diphosphate and inorganic phosphate, thereby performing an anabolic reaction, taking simpler materials and creating a more complicated material. So far, what we've done is talk about photosynthesis and cell respiration. So what we need to do now is know where that ATP is going to be used, which is the third part of this video. So once we have that ATP, what cells do are three major types of work. One, chemical work. Two, transport work. And three, mechanical work. Let's talk about each one of these with some examples. Chemical work is anytime you're using energy in order to derive more complex materials from simpler constituents, just like what we've been dealing with so far. However, remember in unit one, we talked about polymerization, dehydration synthesis, condensation reactions. These are all terminologies that we use to talk about how monomers can become polymers. You see, the thing is when monomers become polymers, what we're doing is we're decreasing entropy. We're creating complexity and that should not be free. And as a result, adenosine triphosphate or its derivatives are often used in order to create polymers from monomers in building components of the cells. So 
specific examples of this might be creating polypeptides or replicating DNA or creating RNA in our gene expression. So all of these different chemical reactions that build cells up are going to require energy. Now, the second type of work was transport work, and we've actually seen this before as well. Transport work is typically dealing with movement of materials in and out of the cell. Specifically, the type of movements that require energy is active transport. So whenever we're pushing protons out of the cell through proton pumps or sodium out and potassium in through the sodium potassium pump that we've discussed in chapter seven, well, all of those processes required ATP, as you may remember. So there it is, transport work, very simple. And the last type of work that cells must perform is mechanical work, which as it sounds is simply the movements that the cells have to make. So whether we're talking about spinning of the flagellum, the movement of the cilia, or the movement of chromatids during cell division via microtubules, well, those are all going to require energy because as Newton said, anytime you want to accelerate an object, it requires energy regardless of how small that object may be. So summing it up, we have chemical work, transport work, and mechanical work, which are all processes that cells need to perform in order to divide, in order to express its genes, and in order to survive in its environment. And all of that required energy. So there is greater nuance to the subject that we're discussing today, but what I wanted to do was to simplify the idea of energy transfer and biochemical reactions in tying all of this together with the things that you may have already learned. And if you want to know more about things like energy diagrams, activation energy, Gibbs free energy, enthalpy change and all of that, well, let us know in the comments and maybe we'll do a more thorough video on bioenergetics. But for today, let's end here so we don't confuse yourselves anymore and stay tuned for the next video, which is going to be about enzymes. And we'll see you in that video. And if you haven't done so already, click like and press subscribe so you can stay tuned for when we release the subsequent videos and we can get through this unit three on energetics together without a scratch. We'll see you guys next time. Take care.